who um, is a uh, who has research um, and activist interests in black womanist and environmental ethics. Uh, he has a particular focus on race, food, and non-human animals. He's the co-creator of Racial Resilience, an anti-racism and anti-bias program that utilizes the combined insights of contemplative practices and critical race theories. His academic publications include The Spirit of Soul Food, Blood in the Soil, The Racial, Racist, and Religious Dimensions of Environmentalism, uh, which is in the Bloomsbury Handbook of Religion and Nature, the passion that informs all of his work evolves out of his family's struggle to loosen the chains of systematic racism. Similar to Bell Hooks, he believes that education is the practice of freedom. He believes that at its broadest level, learning should be transformational. It should transform how the student views herself, her neighbor, and her worldview. He's currently an assistant professor of theology at the University of San Diego, a faith and food fellow at Farm Ford, and a lead pastor of The Loft in Westwood, California. So we're so excited to have you with us, Chris, um, if you don't mind me calling you Chris. Uh, and I will hand the reins over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and grateful for the opportunity to share with you all. Um, I did forget to update my um, bio where now I am an associate professor. So I recently received tenure, which is exciting. Uh, and um, I'm a, very appreciative of the time off that I will be, well, I shouldn't say time off, time away from teaching. I have to do other things, but uh, grateful for that a uh, little bit of time away to do some research and travel and hopefully do some writing. Um, excited to be here. Uh, excited to see how this talk goes, uh, especially because, well, I'll just save some of that stuff for later. Um, so let me go ahead and get going so we have enough time to have a good conversation, a robust discussion. I should preface this by saying I'm a theologian and so, and a pastor. My way of thinking about environmental justice, uh, food justice, and religion and ecology broadly understood is always going to center um, theology. It's going to start from an understanding, I should also say, as a theological ethicist. So I'm, I'm under um what's really important to me is what we ought to do the moral frameworks that we derive our understanding of what it means to be human um, and how we ought uh, live our lives in light of those moral frameworks and so for me one of the challenges i have in in working with churches or religious organizations or even teaching students um is and this is disappointing for me to say, but it's just the reality of the situation when I'm teaching on issues of the environment or teaching on issues of race, um, you know, there seems to be a lack of a theological understanding of the problems of how we got here. Like, right? What are some of the fundamental theological assumptions that undergird the thinking that we have um, adopted and how might we then readdress those and reimagine, right, those foundations? And, and I would argue unless and until we actually can articulate um, what those problems are, understanding the dynamic nature of them, we're, we're really are, are not really addressing some of the foundational issues. And so that's what I, I want to do a part of that today. Uh, this is kind of a hybrid talk uh, of a part of um, some things I write in my book, some things I've written in uh, blood in the soil, other things I've been thinking about recently, and specifically trying to give you all an idea of, of some of the arguments I'm going to make about what we ought to do with respect to food justice um, in the spirit of soul food. Um, and so that's all my, um, you know, contact information if you're interested and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My Twitter is probably a little bit more active uh, than Instagram, but you know, it is what it is. I'm not, I'm like, a, I guess they call it an elder millennial. So I'm like, you know, in my early forties. And so I understand technology. I know how to use it. I'm just used to using it for research, not entertainment. So I'm still a little bit uh, new to this stuff. I should also say before I, I get right into the lecture, um, if it's helpful for you to ask, if you think of a question, it's helpful for you just type the question into the chat. That's totally fine with me too. Um, like I, I won't, um, probably answer questions during the lecture, um, just because it's easier for me just to keep going. Um, but I will be able to return to the, you know, the questions in the chat as we go. Because sometimes I know for I have ADHD, and then if I don't write something down, it could be easy for me to forget it. And I want to make sure that we capture those questions. Um, and hopefully even the questions that you ask, I will answer throughout the lecture. So let's begin. Title of the lecture, Decolonizing the Imago, Imago Day Towards the Creation of an Anti-Oppressive Food Ethic. Um, I, I write, even though I'm an ethicist, uh, for me, uh, 
uh, I, I believe our um, understanding of theological anthropology is crucial um, for the development of a ecological ethic and specifically a food ethic. So how do we get here, right? How do we get to this uh, place where we have such a um, increase in physical hunger with respect to literal hunger in the world, right? Um, food insecurity, food apartheid. How do we get to this particular place? Um, and then as Raj Patel will remind us in his amazing book, Stuffed and Starve, at the same, same time, people who are suffering from um, over, uh, uh, you know, from obesity, right? From having an abundance of unhealthy calories. Like how do we particularly um, get here and how and what role has our religious traditions played in enabling us to be here? Um, I would argue that many secular religious organizations have a general awareness that our food choices have a significant impact on human and ecological well-being, yet they are choosing to do business as normal, um, make normal or make normal nominal low impact changes. Um, why? Why is that the case? You know, I always it's always interesting to me when I look at, um, you know, was it uh, the United Nations um, conference on, was it like COP, you know, whatever they call it, basically the people that get together to care about the environment. You know, the people that fly on private jets to get there, uh, the food choices that they're using, like the way in which it's, this conference is held in such an unsustainable way to yet have these people there talking about sustainability, the corporations there are talking about sustainability. How much of this is really just about performance and about being present in a place that you can say you were at? Um, and while that's an extreme example, I do believe that that exists to an extent on a local level in our congregations and in our communities. And so I sought to try to seek out to understand why that was the case. Um, and what I decided was this kind of roughly, broadly speaking, three things. There's a few more things, but these are the three things I want to talk about today that I think kind of capture a lot of my thinking on this uh, topic. One is a failure of imagination. I think um, this has kind of had to do with hope and hopelessness <laughs> and the ways in which I think um, we have come to believe that the beloved community is an unattainable utopia. Like too many Christians have come to believe this, um, that this idea that we can create um, and build this uh, and follow this spiritual path of radical compassion that I call Christianity, um, that to follow it to its logical conclusion and create the beloved community as articulated by Martin Luther King is just impossible. Um, and this I think has handicapped our ability to actually vision and envision and imagine how we could make actual changes in our communities and in our congregations. I think a part of this is because we have a broken theological anthropology. We have a way in which that allows us to, and I'm gonna explain what I mean by theological anthropology in a little bit, um, but essentially what that means is that we've developed ways to normalize the suffering and oppression of some bodies, marginalized bodies. Um, this is most evident in the ways in which, and again, I know we, we have people from all over the world, so I'm going to speak specifically to what happened in the States and the way in which we responded to the pandemic. And I think as a parent of a three-year-old, the ways in which um, you're just kind of like left in the dark in terms of <laughs> the impact this could have on kids with care for children, all the rhetoric about caring for kids, you realize that fundamentally, um, daycare and school in this country is set up to make sure parents can go to work. That's really what it is. Um, it's not actually about caring for kids. Um, and, and I think, again, this thinking is evident within Christianity as well, in terms of how we view somebody's as having value over others. And lastly, I would say that a part of this comes from our disconnecting from the land and from our family attachments to it. Um, if you're familiar with um, the book, The Christian Imagination, whose author escapes me right now for some reason. Um, the, what the book argues is that this, the, the creation of race required the disconnection from the land and the connection from our stories. And I guess I'll say a little bit more about this later. Um, and this has been crucial for us understanding our identities and who we are and how we've come to be. And so I wanna begin by sharing a little bit of my own story and how I got involved in this work and why I take the particular approach that I do. So, uh, what has most inspired me to be a first generation college graduate, let alone having a PhD, is my grandparents. Um, my grandfather, Robert Martin, was a farm worker. Um, and essentially, you know, when he would tell stories about growing up in Mississippi and Louisiana, um, it, it sounded almost to me like slavery. Like it was insane, the kind of conditions he had to work in um, that are just, you know, existing a couple of generations ago. And yet, despite the, what he had to go through, 
not only did he develop an appreciation of, of the land and nature, um, he just has this sense of gratefulness about him, which is just amazing, actually, when you think about everything he's been through. Um, because for him, he witnessed such terror. He's deeply aware that things could have always been worse. Um, and that's something that I just really admire from him. On my paternal side of the family, uh, they're from Louisiana, and they are Spanish. Um, and so my father is a quarter Spanish. Um, and so I'm whatever that means, one eighth or however that math genetically works. Um, and what's interesting is this transition from whiteness that they had in the um, late 1800s, early 1900s to being mixed. And then how Joe was white until he married a black woman. <laughs> and then the census changed his race. So all this really fascinating family history around this. More compelling, he was an overseer. So he'd have been the person who had been actually like working at a field, telling my grandfather like what to do, uh, my paternal or my maternal grandfather. And so this is just a kind of complex legacy of my family, this kind of interracial thinking, but also the ways in which you can see the how both people, all of us are wrapped up in these racializing dynamics and none of us can escape it. And it impacts us all in some way, shape or form. And for me, I think I have a kind of an interesting and unique perspective because of my own family and ancestry. And knowing that has helped me move through and think critically about how I can engage the work that we do today. First and foremost, I wanna be clear that the challenge we have in front of us is that we live in a world, a global food economy that operates on what I call a food pyramid scheme. Uh, it's pretty much set up to exploit folks um, who are marginalized, who are poor, who are old, like people who are marginal positions. Now, with respect to ecological impact, I wanna be clear that the industrial agriculture disproportionately harms black, indigenous, and poor people in the United States and indigenous and poor people globally. Um, so whether you're talking about clean water in Flint, land sovereignty in Standing Rock, or food justice in Black communities, it is clear that environmental practices are always racialized, and racializing practices are always environmental, right? Environmental practices are always racialized, and racializing practices are always environmental. And so for those of us who are in the states, the Supreme Court basically just said that the EPA can't regulate carbon emissions from factories because, you know, we have a Supreme Court that's just insane. Um, and so who's going to be dis disproportionately harmed in this, right? Like this is, it was, it, it's poor people, particularly because they're talking about what's happening in West Virginia. So we have to be clear, like, right, when these decisions are made, they are always, always like racialized. They are always through the lens of who's going to be disproportionately harmed. And it's poor, in this case, it's mostly, it's poor people, mostly poor black people, but still poor people, broadly speaking, right? And so what this leads to is, again, a situation of food insecurity, where you're looking at this kind of scheme that privileges the access for the majority. Um, I wanna be also make sure that I'm very clear that when I'm talking about um, our domestic food system, I operate from the perspective that it's structurally racist. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just one second. Um, and so because of that, I never use the language of food desert. I talk about and use the language of food apartheid. And the reason I do that is because and you're probably familiar with this, you know, this, this, this usage, I don't think it's too new and not unique to me, um, but a desert is a naturally occurring phenomenon, a naturally occurring econ environmental phenomenon, or it, it can be. Whereas what we see happening in uh, communities, uh, urban communities, communities of color and poor communities is structural. It's a consequence of the legacies of redlining and of uh, racialized housing policies that have marginalized folks their access to foods. And so this is done intentional. And food apartheid as a word makes explicit what is implicit when you use the language of desert, right? Like this is actually done intentionally, structurally. People have designed the system to function this way. And we need to name that and call that out. Um, so what I'm talking about structural racism, I'm really talking about these kinds of interlocking dynamics of economy, politics, and ideologies. Now, a lot of folks when they're thinking about racism, they tend to think about it either from an ideological standpoint, meaning your beliefs, or just a policy standpoint. So if you think about someone like your Ibram Kendi's and maybe some of your more famous race theorists right now, they talk about just from an economic and political aspect, right? How do these policies impact people? I see these three as deeply interconnected. And so I don't know that we can actually separate them. And so as a 
I mean, at a Methodist, so in a very Wesleyan way, I just, I'm like, hey, let's just find the middle and work them all together. Um, And so what I mean, I'm talking about racism is again, looking at the impact of these particular policies, right? So um, I'm looking at tracing the economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, the political marginalization that can be traced along racial lines, right? Who has access to vote and who doesn't, who has access to political power and who doesn't again, who has access to capital and who doesn't. And then ideologies, the ideologies that normalize this, right? What ideologies are in place that allow us to look at the suffering that we see in certain communities and see that suffering as normal, right? Or to an extent, even as deserved because they haven't done the work they need to do to overcome it. Again, rural communities are the places where we see a tremendous amount of suffering. The very places where people grow food are often some of the most, uh, the place where we see hunger the most. Um, in the United States, they make up some of the highest rates of food insecurity um, and they have the highest rates for child food insecurity as well. Food insecurity is also a gender issue. It's a woman's issue. The majority of the people who grow food in our uh, country or in the world are women. The majority of farmers are women. Um, In Africa, women constitute 52% of the population, yet they make up only 75% or they make up 75% of the agricultural workforce, but they um, don't receive the same kind of uh, subsidies and support um, as you see male farmers do. Um, And so this is where we can see this not only as a race issue, not only as a class issue, but also an issue of gender and an issue of gender equity and equality. What happens in slaughterhouses is just evil. Actually, I don't really know what else to say. (laughs) Um, In the ways in which people are, the treatment of those folks that work there. Um, And I think this is important for us to recognize with respect when we're talking about food, um, because so many of us uh, who eat meat get food from places that treat people in a particular way. Um, There is a racial hierarchy in these institutions. Um, I, I actually, Interestingly, had a football player who um, went to the University of San Diego, who's from Smithfield, North Carolina, whose parents worked at the plant. And to hear his explanation of how Smithfield has people who work at Smithfield, who are on the city council, who are the mayor, who basically it's a it's a company town in, in all the ways in which you would fear a company town to exist. And now they can kind of control the image of it in North Carolina. So there's an amazing article in the New York Times that came out a long time ago uh, by Charlie Duff called At the Slaughterhouse, Some Things Never Die. And it talks about the kind of hierarchy that's in place there with respect to gender, race, who's allowed to have power over other bodies, who does what work. You know, for instance, they talk about how black women in this plant were confined to cleaning pig intestines. So they were confined to cleaning chitlins. Um, black men were doing the more labor intensive, difficult work. Um, white women would be like folding boxes or things of that nature, like uh, Latinx or Hispanic women would be on the line. Like they just basically had this kind of caste system in place. Um, and, and this is how it functioned and operated. Um, it's now shifted in places like this in America, at least to be predominantly um, immigrant labor. And so you have immigrants from Central and South America um, and really global immigrants as well, um, who also find their place in this particular kind of racial caste. Um, probably most upsetting and, and, and disappointing is what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this Tyson plant in Waterloo uh, managers were uh, fired um, because they were caught betting, having a betting ring on workers getting COVID. Um, so because they passed laws in the states that said um, this was uh, essentially an emergency um, for food production, that we had to have these um, factories to stay open. Um, they incentivized workers to come to work even if they were sick because the only way to get some of the bonus money was if you came to work this many days in a row. Um, and so that just spread COVID along the floors. Obviously a lot of people died. Um, and what happened was these managers were taking bets on who was sick and if they would live and who would get COVID next. It was pretty terrible. But again, this kind of speaks to the point I was trying to make with respect to the ways in which we have devalued life. There is a epidemic of suicide, um, farmer suicide, globally. This is something that gets some attention, um, not nearly enough attention, I would argue. Um, 
And so some of the data I have in here is older because a lot of the data isn't tracked. This is a big part of the problem with respect to like how, in my own research, trying to find updated data because after President Trump got elected in the States, a lot of data stopped being tracked and places that I would go to find data was just didn't exist anymore. And so that's kind of where we still are uh, until somebody decides to actually change that. Um, so in 2016, the CDC uh, released a study showing that people working in agriculture um, were the most likely, were the, they take their lives at a higher rate than any other occupation in the US. Um, I would argue this is because people who work in this area, people who are farmers really care about being able to provide food. Um, it's a part of their identity. And when that gets taken away from them, they struggle to know who they are in the midst of this. And the stress and strain of growing food on a this kind of scale they're being asked to is tremendous. Um, and so when you hear people talk about, oh, we care about the farmers, we care about the farmers, most likely they're talking about corporations who own essentially the seeds that the farmers are going to, not actual on the ground farmers. Um, so whether it be in South Africa or Sri Lanka or in other places, um, it, Farmers are suffering from mental health crisis. And I would encourage you to read this article that you see on here from The Guardian. Um, I can share these slides if y'all want. Um, it is, um, it's disturbing to say the least. And so again, this is a situation that we're in. So that's all the sad stuff. <laughs> that's all the sad stuff. How did we get here? This is, I wouldn't say this isn't sad, but at least it's not as depressing as the other slides we just got going through. It, get, it, it peps up, it gets, it gets a little bit you know, happier as we move forward. Um, I argue that it's because we have a faulty understanding of what it means to be human. Um, and a lot of that is tied to the legacies of colonialism. And so since the onset of coloniality, and by coloniality, this is the kind of academic term to describe really the colonial encounter. So you're talking roughly around the 1500s moving forward. Um, since the onset of coloniality, the human has become a projection of what Emily Towns calls the fantastic white hegemonic imagination. I love this term actually, because it just really speaks to the ways in which it's fantastic. Um, meaning that the ideas and projections of what it means to be human by white folks projected upon other people of color sometimes are just broadly just fantastic. Something that doesn't make sense. And I'll images of this in a moment. Um, it's by Eurocentric folks who I see themselves as white. It's hegemonic because, right, it's something that's nom uh, 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 normal, normalized and dominant. Um, and it is just this imagination. It's this way of creating a caricature of certain folks to uh, justify power over others. And so what's happened is that their notion of what it means to be human has rendered human virtually synonymous with white men. And this has impacted the ways in which we think about what it means to be human in Christianity and in religion in general. And so the anthropological problem that has limited the development of an intersectional ecological ethic for people of color and other people has often been the unconscious adoption of a way of being human that is filtered through the projection of the white imagination that normalizes the exploitation of life for its own sake. And so what I'm arguing for is the kind of decolonization of Western Christianity's assumption of what it, of the human requires us to view being human as a praxis, right? So what I mean by praxis is understand being human as a process of learning, unlearning, applying, and realizing our humanness in anti-oppressive ways. Right. So rather than just making the assumption that, oh, we kind of are what we are with respect to how we understand human, I see human, again, from a Wesleyan sense, for those of you who, are, who know about Wesleyan theology or are Methodist, as a kind of a process of sanctification. Right. Like it's a process of becoming. We are always striving to become more Christ. Like we are striving to become more what it means to be human in its ideal form. Whereas right? Paul talks about how we see ourselves dimly. Right. But we don't see ourselves quite clearly. That's what I mean. This idea of becoming human, like literally a process rather than, again, making the kind of assumptions that we've already figured everything out. Um, so some of the legacies we struggle with as a consequence of this uh, of colonialism is the cheapening of life, um, both cheapening of non-human nature, the life of non-human nature and human life. Um, so cheapening is kind of a strategy, right? In this book, amazing book, History of the World and Seven Cheap Things by Raj Patel and Jason Moore, um, they argue that cheapening is a strategy, a practice of violence that mobilizes all kinds of work, human and animal, botanical and geological, with as little compensation as possible. This should sound very obvious and familiar. Um, and so what it is, is basically how can we extract as much value for as minimal cost, 
So coloniality has enabled this kind of cheapening, right? When we think about the fact that we have an agricultural system in the United States, and I would argue in Britain, I mean, just, just off the top of my head, like agricultural system that's premised on exploitation of free labor. To the United States, you have this legacies of slavery that is just unpaid labor that's producing all the you know, vast majority of both food and goods that are um, exported within the country. Same thing with Britain with respect to uh, raw goods and sugar, right? And so you have this idea that says these people can be exploited and this is fundamentally okay, that some people can be exploited and this is fundamentally okay, theologically justified. And we're gonna say about that in a moment, right? And so because of this, you have this idea of cheap nature because of, or essentially as a consequence of this logic, you develop this notion that that nature in and of itself can be cheap, right? And so this creates this division between our idea of what it means to be in society and what it means to be outside of society, right? So our modern notion of society has a unique antonym. So in nature, you are either a part of society or you're part of nature. You're either fit for society or you're a savage and fit for the wild. This language should sound somewhat familiar because you see the ways in which language like this is still used to historically, you know, use and still use today to delineate who should have and who should not have power. Importantly, once the boundaries between society and nature were created, they were policed through explicit and implicit discriminatory practices, practices, meaning that you weren't allowed to have a kind of progress out of your particular kind of caste or space. And so the reason you can have this distinction between humans and disconnecting them from nature, if you say the human has nothing to do with nature, it allows you to read the creation narratives and read um, or be in nature and think of them as something that's completely other, something that could be exploited to your own particular benefit. That's relatively new within not only the Christian tradition, but within the ways in which human beings engage with the uh, non-human nature, again, beginning with coloniality, roughly in the 1500s. You also have the cheapening of human life, right? And this is where I think religion, unfortunately, um, doesn't help. So it was really during the 15th and 16th centuries where these ideas began to circulate that enabled the nation state and Christian theology to weaponize hierarchy in order to cheapen human life. Um, with the United States, you have someone like John Locke, who argues that basically uh, Black people should always be subservient to white people. And that's just fundamentally a part of how the nation should be structured, even as while well, he's arguing for freedom and autonomy for all humans, except what Black people and really except Indigenous people, except women, right? These are these exceptions in the ways in which they are conceptualizing freedom. And then on top of that, you see Christian theology also make the argument um, that Black people did not and do not um, uh, image God in the same ways as white people do. And so it's no coincidence that colonialism and chattel slavery emerge during this particular period um, because essentially white Christians argued that these Black people were too close to nature to be like them, right? They were more like animals and therefore they were distant from God. This is why you saw and you read these narratives of people that were slow to convert folks to Christianity because there's this belief that, well, you couldn't enslave Christians. And so then once you made them Christians and you still could say, well, they could still be enslaved because they're not quite as human as we are. And we're helping them understand what it means to be human. We're saving their souls by teaching them how to not be a savage. Right. And you see this uh, kind of thinking embodied in this uh, cartoon. Um, uh, and what you see here is Uncle Sam teaching. Um, the Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Cuba, so these uh, colonized islands, what it means to be a good student, like the other states behind them. You see an indigenous person in the corner reading a book, but upside down, the Chinese person not even allowed in the classroom, and you see the black person isn't even allowed to participate in the lesson, um, right? They're just having to uh, clean. And so, Liberation theologians have tried to address this kind of way of thinking with respect to the cheapening of human life. Um, you know, they have recognized that racism that's present in our contemporary an anthropologies, but I would argue that we have not sufficiently decolonized what it means to be human, because generally speaking, non-white people have argued that we are human too, rather than saying there's a problem with how we're defining what it means to be human, right? And by arguing that we are human too, as I say, hey, treat us like you treat other people, like, you know, treat us how you treat yourselves, we're human too. That does little to deconstruct the racism, sexism, and ecological extractivist thinking that normalizes oppression. 
And so we see this way of thinking with respect to the way we talk about race and animality often, right? We see this way of thinking in terms of this kind of dehumanization. To be clear, when someone disparages a group of human beings as being animals or animalistic, they do not mean that a group of people fall outside the scientific category of homo sapiens. Rather, they are stating that these human beings do not look, live, worship, or reason normally, where normal is understood as Eurocentric white norms. In other words, when one does not act white or when one behaves in ways that challenge white dominance, they are seen as an animal, right? If you behave in ways that challenge dominant white cultural norms, dominant ways of thinking, dominant ways of doing, you are then, so you are eligible to be dehumanized because whiteness is understood as the ideal understanding and projection of what it means to be human. White supremacy ultimately creates a hierarchy based on race and skin color and it equates the idealized human with whiteness. As such, an open acceptance of the negative status of the animal is a tacit acceptance of the hierarchical system of white supremacy in general. So what I mean by this is that the animal really serves as the anchor to the logic of white supremacy. Our modern delineation of human humanity and animal and animality were constructed along racial lines. So we have to be clear when we're talking about using the language of the animal, what we actually are saying within respect to the kind of racial caste system that we are in, right? The animal, the other, ultimate sapient other is this anchor of white colonial logic. This isn't, again, for people of color, this probably isn't new to many of you. <laughs> like you're hearing this, you're like, well, okay, this, I haven't heard this before, but this makes sense because again, We've been writing about this for a long time. Um, in reading Russia of the Earth, Franz Fanon, he writes like, in plain talk, the colonial subject is, is reduced to the state of the animal, right? If you look at the, or read any articles where police are talking about people of color, where they're caught off camera or they're caught on camera, but off um, the cuff, they use animal language so frequently, right? to talk about people who are not behaving in ways that they think ought to be behaving, right? And that just talks about the structure of what it means to be human and how it's structured and the way the animal can be equated with being a kind of less than human. Put simply, what I'm arguing is that the methodological reasoning that normalizes racism and white supremacy does not discriminate based on species, right? It just, it just doesn't. Um, and I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the oppression and exploitation of non-human beings and animals are the same. That is not what I'm saying. And that is something that I think drives I think. most people of color up the wall. However, I am arguing that the, clone, that the exploitation of non-human animals normalizes a colonial theolo theological anthropology. So when we allow non-human animals to be exploited as they are in factory farms, right, or in, on farms, or just exploited in general, what we are saying is that there are certain lives that have less value that can be exploited, right? It creates this dualistic hierarchical understanding of the human person that justifies exploitation of non-human others, right? Where the human is understood to mean straight white men and those who perform whiteness as such, right? The human is not, it can be white men, but also are you in alignment with this kind of normalized structure of oppression? Again, this isn't new. I wanna be clear, like, so I keep pulling back. I'm like, I know I'm saying stuff. Some of you guys are like, probably like, oh my gosh, I hadn't thought about this or this may be a little bit too far. This is a history. I'm just trying to help us crystallize it, right? So when you look at this image right here, the ways in which race and animals are deeply inter interconnected and it infiltrates the language that we use in the way in which we practice religion. So in this image, you see uh, two black men and that are staring at a chicken and that caption reads two souls, but with a single thought, this idea that as soon as a black people see chicken, they can't think of anything else. Um, this idea right here that talks about in the bottom right beneath that, a savage black man saying, for Ahmad, I'm having chicken for breakfast where chicken is euphemism for white women. Um, and so images like this not only justify um, the, and talk about the animalization of black men, but also justify the ways in which we have to preserve quote unquote, you know, white women purity um, and the ways in which their identities are weaponized to justify harming um, black men. And if you've been following what's been happening with the resurfacing of the Emmett Till case, this is a prime example of, of um, the way in which that kind of thinking was used. 
Black women are wrapped up in this as well. The mammy imagery is, is well known and documented in the ways in which Black women are portrayed as being perfect um, or being fit and best fit for taking care of white people's kids, not even their own kids. This restaurant uh, right here is called the Coon Chicken Inn. Uh, I did not stutter. I'll just actually go to that because that's like kind of when that's crazy, Coon Chicken Inn. And the idea behind this restaurant is that Black men especially are you know, so addicted to chicken, they know about how to not only cook chicken, but prepare chicken, and, and they're going to make the best chicken, and white people are going to want to come there and eat it. And they did um, until it was closed, uh, in part because of the name. And again, you see the ways in which you have these um, uh, anti-slavery posters created, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? Um, and the ways in which um, you see a sapien, um, you know, uh, image created, or a simian image created, uh, basically saying that obviously, you know, Black people are more akin to monkeys. So essentially, Americans, and actually, given again, the state of this uh, conference, I, I'd be willing to say uh, Eurocentric folks, so folks who are racialized as white, are implicitly taught and socialized to accept the normative structure of nature that places human beings at the pinnacle. Racial formation ensures that the human is understood to be white, Patriarchy ensures that he is male. Heterosexism and ableism ensures that he is straight and idealized. And so when people of color and women try to be full human beings within this flawed vision of the human, we are striving towards a way of being human that replicates an anti-oppressive hierarchical model that places whiteness, maleness, and heterosexism as the pinnacles of life. So unless we attend to this anthropology, environmental activists, marginalized folks, and especially people of faith are at risk of subscribing to the social and theological norms, that have normalized oppression and exploitation of non-human nature. And so what does it mean to kind of move past this and decolonize it? What might an alternative vision look like? Um, what I try to talk about in my book is at its most basic level, a decolonial theolog theological anthropology really aims to describe who we're called to be, how we're called to live, what we're called to do, right? And so I'm talking about theological anthropology here. I'm talking about the relationship between um, God and humans, humans and humans and humans and non-human nature, right? Literally what it means to be human from the Christian theological framework. And so I'm arguing that the norm that makes this anthropology decolonial is the starting assumption that all creation has sacred worth. This assumption is rooted in not only the biblical text, but in Christian tradition. So for people that, for my tradition, like the Black church tradition, the Bible still carries a lot of theological weight when you're talking about issues of environmental justice. Like you have to actually reference scripture in some way, shape or form to help people understand how this is relevant and how this matters. The creation narratives matter. And so I wanna make sure we use those to talk about the relationships that we're supposed to have that are, I think, embedded in those narratives and how those poems really cast a vision, a kind of ironies, and quite honestly, about how we are supposed to be with non-human nature. And so solidarity, uh, self-love, and holistic interdependence are kind of the three things that I argue for. Solidarity and self-love look different for people of color and white folks, and I'll speak briefly on them. So for people of color, and particularly Black folks, embracing the divine command to love ourselves is crucial because it allows us to begin to heal the psychological residues of, of coloniality. Right. So for those of us who are people of color, we deal with internalized racism, we deal with colorism, we deal with dehumanization, we have been taught to think of ourselves as less than. And so loving ourselves as we are, recognizing God's grace, embracing that grace is a powerful balm for healing this trauma that we are carrying that we can't help carry because it's present around us. And often we dismiss it, we set it aside, but what I'm inviting us to do is actually turn inward and tend to it, to name it, to know that it actually exists. Solidarity um, exists in a way that kind of helps us foster relationships, um, uh, you know, across difference, um, foster relationships uh, uh, with the land that mirror the life and teachings of Jesus. Um, whose earthly ministry was to be in solidarity with the marginalized and care for the least of these. And so that's this Jesus right here. This is a rendered image of a first century Palestinian Jew. Um, this Jesus uh, fostered interdependent relationships with people who would be, otherwise be outcast. Um, the practice of solidarity as demonstrated by Jesus asked Christians to feel the suffering of exploited workers as if it were our own. I also want to extend this solidarity to non-human animals and non-human nature when the harm was unnecessary for our survival. So this way of solidarity fundamentally contradicts 
the kind of solidarity we might see in this Eurocentric understanding of Jesus, right? It's not this idea of a person who's, you know, is in robes clean, just coming down and saying, oh, you know, be like me. That's not the kind of way we're talking about solidarity. Self-love for Euro-Americans is going to be different. This is really going to say for those of you who are white, who are committed to decolonial theological anthropology, it requires a different focus. Self-love, I argue, mirrors by Jesus emptying oneself of the colonial assumptions that frame their self-understanding. And so it's the idea of beginning to discover who you are as a white person outside of coloniality in order to love yourself, right? Not the projected idea of yourself, but yourself as tied to your land, to your family, you know, to who you are, not as to this construction of whiteness as such. Solidarity then begins by cultivating a consciousness that decenters white ex the white experience as the truth. And rather it centers uh, black, indigenous, and other people of color or BIPOC social and theological reflections. At its best, this leads to the renewal and reconciliation of relationships between white people and those whom they or their ancestors have harmed. This doesn't mean that um, the white experience doesn't matter. What it does mean is that the white experience has been centered so much, right, that a corrective requires a recentering, you know, a decentering of the white experience to center the experience of other people of color, right? It's that it's saying that the white experience has mattered so much, right, that that there has to be other perspectives brought in that need to be given heavier theological weight. Secondly, it requires anamnesis. So the intentional remembering of the exploited, marginalized, and minoritized victims and the historical legacy of oppression. Um, while none of you are at fault for the mistakes and misdeeds and evil actions of your ancestors, that you all, those of you who are white, bear responsibility of reconciliation so that they may begin to heal from the wounds of their past as well. This isn't easy. I want to be clear. What I'm asking white folks to do this is hard. Like, if it was easy, honestly, we wouldn't have racism. So clearly, this is hard. Um, but often what happens when I'm teaching about race and I talk about race and ecology, people get defensive. And what I'm asking you to do, rather in the midst of being defensive, because that's probably some of what's happening, maybe, I don't want to say, but that typically what's happened. I would invite you to take what contempt is best described as a U-turn. So when I teach this stuff in my class, I teach a lot of things alongside contemplative practices. Because I want to help people understand and learn and pay attention to what's going on in their inner worlds to turn inward and say, well, why do I feel this way, right? Attend to those feelings rather than just reacting and being enmeshed in that reactivity. By enmeshed, I mean just not being able to disentangle yourself from your anger, your frustration, your fear, your guilt, your shame. Actually say, well, what is it am I actually afraid of? What is it that I'm angry about? Within each of those reactivities, they can tell us what is underneath that so that we actually can attend to the reality of the suffering that's within rather than the projected suffering we've created. Um, I argue that each of those reactivities have a kernel of wisdom within there that can be liberative for us, that they can serve as guideposts as we decolonize our minds by helping us understand and identify the assumptions that reinforce the logic of a coloniality. And so by being compassionate with our parts that react that way, by attending to the fears, the longings, and the angers, and perhaps the obstructive gifts that we have, we're able to gain a critical distance from those reactivities and not allow them to really control the seat of our consciousness. Holistic interdependence for all folks accepts that we are created in the image of God and that we are called to imitate the, what I call the solidaristic love practice of Jesus. Um, this way of thinking I want to be, is not egalitarian, right? Um, it is anthropocentric, which is, I think, something that I would say is, I won't say unique, but um, from an American perspective, somewhat unique in terms of my construction of my environmental ethic. But it's anthropocentric through the lens of Black spirituality that sees all life as sacred. This is something I fundamentally got from my grandfather. Like, I, I grew up recognizing that, yes, I have a particular kind of power, but that have, have a kind of responsibility with it when it comes to non-human nature. That's a part of what it means to be human in a way that recognizes that nature is a part of our community. There is no dualistic thinking between human and nature, right? We are all a part of this interdependent um, life. And so recognizing our interdependence can help disabuse us of this kind of need for a, or, or thinking that all hierarchy has to be oppressive. 
all hierarchy doesn't have to be oppressive. Within the Western frameworks, often hierarchy can be oppressive. But if you look at other religious traditions, other cultures, you see many examples of non-oppressive hierarchies. And so again, I wanna talk about the failure of imagination of some um, Eurocentric ways of thinking that argue that everything has to be egalitarian. I just don't think that is actually true. And so what does it look like to wrap this up in terms of how does this get lived out on a practical level? Um, so I make sure we have time for Q and A. Um, so trying to imagine how one might live in according to these three, three logical principles um, is difficult. It means you have to wrestle with the realities of colonial thinking. And so in developing these three theological grounded practices, what I call soulful eating, justice for food workers and caring for the earth, I, I didn't want to retrieve an ideal past or legitimize our current food systems. Rather, from a, as a Black American perspective, I really tried to imagine what soul food could look like today, given the pervasive nature of food and environmental injustice, Black Indigenous and people in Black Indigenous communities of color um, and poor communities. And so for me, soul food is a big part of my identity, a part of who I am. And so I talk about soulful eating. Now, this is something that all people can do, but it comes from the Black experience. Soulful eating as African-American Christians and those who are committed to being in solidarity with Black Christians to reflect upon our past and build on a collective culinary wisdom for our ancestors to, in order to forge a new future of soul food. Um, I argue for what I call an agent-specific and context-specific Black veganism. I want to be clear. <laughs> I know I've said that multiple times. I'm not saying all people need to be vegan. I'm not saying all people. Uh, what I am saying is that we have created a system where the animal is used to dehumanize Black people, right? Because of the animalization of BIPOC folks and because of the ecological impact of factory farming on Black communities and poor communities, as someone who can't opt out of those systems, I argue that we should opt out of those systems. But I also recognize that someone who grew up poor, who grew up food insecure, this wasn't possible for me when I was a kid. And so I started talking about agent-specific and context-specific, right? So Black veganism, as I describe it, is more of what we might say technically is an ontological veganism. And so that just means a way of thinking, and I'll explain this on the next slide, that makes explicit the racial hierarchy and structures of our food system, right? And so in this sense, it's a response to structural racism, right? An agent-specific and context-specific Black veganism makes explicit the connection to the practice of caring for the earth when we consider the ecological impact of industrial agriculture, the decolonial theological anthropological goals of solidarity and holistic interdependence as Christians to work toward ending oppressive human, non-human animal relationships on which our current food system thrives. And through the practice of Black veganism, soulful eating decenters whiteness by making explicit the connection between modern race thinking and the animal. I got the ideas for what I'm calling Black veganism through um, from my friends Af and So Cole in their book, Afroism. Um, and so they talk about using the term black and saying the blackness of black veganism signifies a commitment to an anti-oppressive way of being in the world that grounds our notions of humanity and animality in ways that influence what we consume. And also I call it a kind of culinary consciousness raising built off again, the work of Bell Hooks. So black veganism helps us to understand how structural racism became embedded in our food system and how a racist dehumanization is linked to ecological animal exploitation. And so by opting not to consume animal products, Black veganism forces us to explore how white supremacist race thinking extends beyond black bodies and is inclusive of non-human animals and the biotic community. And black veganism forces us to examine how the language of animality and animal characteristics have been used as a tool to justify the oppression of any being who deviates by species, race, or behavior from white Christian norms, where the white heterosexual male is considered the ideal godlike being worthy of all worship and praise. So this veganism, as you can see, is very, human-centered. It's very anthropocentric. Um, I, I don't practice veganism for the animals. I love the animals. My wife is a veterinarian. Animals are great. This is about making explicit the ways in which our current food system, specifically animal agriculture, harms people of color and it harms poor people, right? And so I'm talking about how might we opt out of that system and create alternative ways. One way we can actually tell our stories, though, that's really important, that's crucial for this way of eating, is through cooking. And um, that's something that I love to do. And it's a way of transmitting that kind of culinary and agricultural wisdom from our ancestors. A prime example is someone like Sue Bailey Thurman, who put together this National Council of Negro Women's Cookbook that actually was structured 
not in a typical cookbook way, but a structure like a calendar. I talked about eating certain things on certain days as a way to tell Black history. So how might we reclaim the kitchen as sacred space to tell our stories, right, of how we've come to survive, thrive, and flourish? How might we use the kitchen as a way of liberation, of connecting generations, right? So when they're in the kitchen, we can see this not as a chore, right, but as a time for us to share and authenticity, who we are and how we have come to be through food. Food is so deeply personal, right? And so that's why I know what I'm saying is challenging because it is personal and that matters. And so I'm saying we need to utilize that to tell a message and teach a message of anti-oppression, not only to our communities, but to our children as well. So justice for food workers takes seriously, um, you know, buying fair trade, buying local, purchasing food through CSAs and grocery co-ops, becoming politically active, like those kind of basic simple things that many of you probably already know. This practice really does seek to address the hidden costs within the food system by also being politically active. Um, I talk about using churches as food sovereign spaces. Um, this is where some of you probably are already doing some of this work. Um, so rather than debating if Black people would or ought to practice Black veganism, I argue that our collective energies are best served by promoting veganism alongside food sovereignty. So this requires us to work to eliminate the structural barriers that have displaced grocery stores from BIPOC communities, advocating for raising the minimum wage to a living wage to eliminate poverty so people can actually afford good food, to help create a food system, to help create food sovereign spaces so that we can gain more control of our food supply. My friend and colleague, Heber Brown at the Black Church Food Security Network is totally on board with me in this work. And they're essentially trying to do these three things in um, the East Coast as they work. We both looked at someone like Fannie Lou Hamer and her Freedom Farm Cooperative um, as a pillar, an example of how to do this work. Most people think of Fannie Lou Hamer as a political activist, but she was an agriculture activist as well. And she created her Freedom Farm as a way to respond to the marginalization people experienced once they got politically active, um, farmers fired them from their land, basically. And so um, they needed food, they just starved them. They said, well, if you wanna vote, we just make sure you starve. And so she started this farm as a way to address that kind of starvation, to give people jobs, to have food sovereignty, and she's not limited to black people, right? She let people, white people buy into this co-op as well. And so this wasn't about this kind of black nationalism as much as it was a way to address this historical injustice that was embedded in our food systems. Lastly, caring for the earth um, asks us to advocate for an end to industrial animal farming practices that have increased production and increased production of plant-based meat and meat alternatives as they have better relationships with the land. In this way, practicing caring for the earth promotes the relational and affective dimensions of soulful eating through the growing of food that could be prepared in community. This for me requires us to reimagine what church land is. And, and I, I work at a church that's in the city. Like we literally, all our land is concrete because you know we're in LA. Um, and so what we're doing is working with other churches actually <laughs> to grow food and deciding this one current church we're working with, should we grow food that feeds the community or, or cash crops that we can employ people to grow that actually still can serve in the community in some particular kind of way. So this doesn't have to be, this isn't one, there isn't one way to do this, I wanna say, there's multiple ways. But we have to see the land that we do have as usable land rather than land just to grow grass. And so I've worked with um, people at Seminary Hill Farm at Methodist Theological Seminary, uh, Methodist Theological School in Ohio, people at Princeton, um, folks at Drew, folks at Wake Forest, like tons and tons of seminaries in the United States um, to help them think through and train clergy how to think like this. Um, Soul Fire Farm is a black farm in upstate New York that grow, while they're not Christian, they are spiritual and they use a lot of the same kind of thinking with respect to food sovereignty. And obviously you're probably familiar with Wangari Matai and just her amazing work with respect to talking about food sovereignty and farming in Africa. And so I use a lot of her principles with respect to talking about the global food economy. Um, that is probably six minutes longer than I want to go. So I wanna just say thank you. Um, and for this present, thank you for having me here. Hopefully this presentation, you found it interesting <laughs> and that there are some questions. I'm sure you have plenty of questions. I'm sure there's gonna be some folks who are like, oh, this wasn't what I was expecting and that's okay. So, uh, so yeah, I look forward to the conversation and the Q and A um, for any questions y'all may have. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, um, Chris, that was really fantastic. Um, I'm teaching Sylvia Winter at the moment. So, you know, all the conversations about of who is the sovereign subject of, of 
salvation and and of our world was is 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 so perfect there and um thank you for taking us through not only uh, sort of the sort of a historical understandings of things of what, what certain worldviews are and how they are framed and so on, um, as well as opening up um, these really important, I think, inter intersecting ways in which justice must be achieved. Um, so I can see that there's a lot of um, questions already coming through. Uh, so if you do want to ask a question, please put in the chat to raise your hand. Um, I'll start us off with a question from Sue, who wants to know um, how your discussion of self-love relates to or differs from Audre Lorde's understanding of self-care. Audre Lorde is amazing. <laughs> and so I, I can't say that it necessarily is all that um distinct with the exception of where i would say and again i'm not i haven't read all of audrey lord so i want to make i want to say this with with a certain degree of caution um and probably why someone why i refer to bell hooks more than i refer to audrey lord is there some of her writings that i have read that i think could be more inclusive of the male experience and talk about dismantling patriarchy in ways that are um offer a roadmap like bell hooks has a book called um the world of change about uh patriarchy and male love like how we might actually love folks in genuine ways um and so that's probably why i lean on her work a little bit more because i think she tries to have a more constructivist response um and where i find audrey lord helpful particularly the way she talks about um uh, the use of arrows in the erotic, I find that extremely, extremely helpful. Um, I think that's probably why I'd lean a little bit more that way. So I'm not, I'm not super familiar, but I mean, I'm familiar with Audrey Lord, but I don't know that I would say that it's necessarily that distinguished um, other than I want to be clear that when I'm talking about self-love for people of color, especially that it really is about a healing of a kind of trauma. And when I'm talking about racialized trauma it's it's, it's unique to each of us, depending on our race, but we all are traumatized from the structure of race, right? Coloniality shaped all of our understandings of ourselves as it relates to others. It's given us this false understanding of what it means to be human. And so we all carry a particular kind of racialized trauma. And so the dismantling of it is gonna be different, right? One of the things that um, I talk about with respect to, when I teach about race is um, when I always say like, you know, if you grow up as a person of color in the States, you probably have more or less, I would say, a high school understanding of racism um, because you have to understand racism in order to survive. But as a white person, you don't. And so broadly speaking, you don't understand actually how racism works unless you really put effort for them to learn it. And so that creates what people call um, a kind of uh, white fragility, um, which I, along with another, uh, many other activists and, and um, people who teach this, um, lean on the work of Rizma Menachem in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, where he calls it a kind of a frost fragility. And by that he means um, it's up to white folks to do the work to develop the resilience, to have these conversations, because you just don't have to have the resilience because you've never had the conversations. Um, this is something I've experienced personally with just my wife. My wife is white and, and all of our marriage, and particularly after having a multiracial son, you, you, I see the ways in which she's had to learn how we're gonna process and work through our particular kinds of encounters. And this kind of ties into the question that David had about generalizing about white imagination. I wanna be, you know, when we're talking about racism, I wanna, it's important for us to recognize what it is we're specifically talking about. Often our definitions um, of racism are woefully inadequate. Racism isn't just calling other people's names, right? Racism isn't just like, it's not that. There's a structural dimension to it, as I mentioned, those three spheres. And so something is racist when it really intersects both the economics, ideologies, and politics, right? Those spheres have to work together. And so power is at play here that I think is really important. And so generalizing what we might say, the fantastic white hegemonic imagination makes explicit that is a Eurocentric worldview that we're operating out of that created the idea of black that created the idea of the other right we are all operating in that what that imagination that's the imagination of colonialism um and so it's all it's about recognizing that this is how we've been taught to be human that how we've been taught to see the other it's not to blame shame or judge any of us as much as to say this is the reality 
So how do we respond out of that? And it's also really important for us to not think of ourselves as exceptions to this reality, right? Like we have this thing, this is another thing I teach called racial exceptionalism. And often for those of us who are especially liberal, we think we're fine, we're not racist. We're like, ah, you know, there's no racism and I don't do anything racist. <laughs> and what happens is as you peel back the layers, you're like, oh, well, you know, there are some folks in my community that are some of my friends and they kind of say some things and I try not to pay attention to them too much because, you know, whatever. So they're racist, but not me. Well, there's some people in my family who believe some things and maybe they said some stuff, but you know, they're racist, but not me. And then as you continue to pull back, you say, oh, wow, I've had some assumptions. I've had some things, I've said some things that were racist. But again, the key here is we often totalize ourselves in doing those things saying, well, I, I am a racist. That's not helpful and it's not accurate. That means we've had a racist thought or done a racist thing. And that's normal because we've been taught to view that as normal. I have done those things. I've written about it in my book because that's how powerful race is. But I see those awarenesses, those moments as moments of liberation, right? When I recognize I'm doing something that actually is not only against my own best interest, but it's dehumanizing others. It's wow, I didn't know that was within me. And now this hurts, this sucks. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. But I can take this as an opportunity to grow and learn rather than to shame myself. Um, and so again, this isn't about blaming anyone. I want to, this is really about trying to help us understand the system that has shaped our way of thinking um, that's just so pervasive. Um, like it'd be foolish of me to think I'm not a capitalist, even though I really critique capitalism. I live in such a capitalist society. That's kind of like, you know, I don't like it. Like I try to resist it, but it's really kind of a part of how I think. So I have to try as best I can to acknowledge that and say, okay, how might, where might that be influencing my thinking rather than thinking I'm an exception to it. Um, so anyway, hopefully that answered both of those questions. Um, Thanks, Chris. Excellent. Um, there's another question from John Anderson, who wants to know if you could say a little bit more about food sovereignty. Yeah, and I'd be, and if anyone else has any other thoughts on this, jump in because um, because I, I will feel free to type something in the chat. Um, when I'm talking about food sovereignty, I'm specifically like leaning on the folks who created that, which are part of the um, peasants um, in Brazil, I think is where it started. Um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, and when they're talking about food sovereignty, they're really talking about the control of the production of food, um, food that's not used for fuel, it's actually used for eating and consumption, um, having control over um, the prices of food, like just basically controlling the supply chain and the commodities, right? Um, and that is a, just a fundamental shift um, as opposed to the kind of framework we have uh, with respect to food that sees food as a commodity to be um, globally exported. Um, food sovereignty takes seriously that it's a local way of thinking about food that takes seriously the uh, impact of, of uh, or the importance of providing food security for those who are within those communities rather than growing food for the exportation of others or, or ex, um, uh, not exploitation, exportation. Um, so, that's broadly speaking how I define it. I'm going to put the link in for the uh, organization that has really coined the term because I think they offer a better description than I just gave off the top of my head. Um, but that's essentially what I mean when I talk about food sovereignty. Thanks, Chris. Um, Ray uh, Lay would like to know uh, what can we start to do and stop doing um, so that we can decolonize in our life, in our culture, and in our church? This is. That's such a great question. And to me, I mean, <laughs> uh, I think part of the reason I spent so much time on theology, which none of you probably were expecting, you're like, wow, this is a lot of theology, <laughs> is because I, I actually really do believe it starts with thinking about what it means for us to practice being human. And so what does that look like? So what does it look like for you to embody self-love, solidarity, in holistic interdependence, like on, on, on your everyday life? Like what does it look like for you to embody solidarity within your family, within your community, um, within your church? And it's gonna be different for different folks, right? So that's why, because that's why I'm not given, broadly speaking, general rule of thumbs. But I would say a lot of this is gonna require you, I guess I will give you one thing to do, relationships. 
we all have to cultivate relationships across difference. And so one of the ways in which for me, when I think about, and part of the reason I put ableism in there, even though you didn't see a lot of ableist work is I've been doing a lot more disability studies, research and writing. I'm on a disability um, studies com uh, committee at my university. And I see now how I had an ableist framework and even writing my book. <laughs> and, and so for me, solidarity was cultivating relationships with people who are disabled and them teaching me or helping me learn how my thinking was ableist and challenging me to change the language I was using also to be invitational into ways in which a, a, um, a disabled person could participate in many of these activities. Um, and so relationships were crucial for me to be in solidarity, like absolutely crucial. Um, Self-love for me, again, is gonna be different depending on you know what your racial identity are or your gender identity, but actually learning to not to love your who you are and not be defensive, I would argue is, is, is so, so hard. I make it sound like it's easy, but it's really difficult. I'm gonna actually put a, here's one link because I have. So that's the link um, to Via Campesina um, with respect to food sovereignty. And I'll put another link in the chat for um, a book by um, uh, Frank Rogers about compassion and how learning to be grounded and cultivating what he calls self-compassion is really helpful in this regard. Um, decolonizing, as I would say, and last thing I'll say, because I'm talking too much. If you, can, if you can't explain how something isn't like racist, like, like how is something like resisting racism, sexism, heterosexism, then you can kind of make the assumption that it is within your church structure within your organizational structure. So you have to be able to articulate how this is resisting those frameworks. That's really another place to start with respect to different policies you have in terms of decolonizing those policies. This takes work, I wanna be clear. Um, this takes work, uh, and but it's intentional and it's work towards being anti-oppressive, which is kind of the language I use much more than liberatory. Thank you. Um, excellent. And it's always great to see Via Campesina links. So there's a question from Ellen Larson Davidson, um, who uh, says it reminded her of growing up in the Midwest and how food insecurity among farming communities in childhood, but also the racism connected to meatpacking plants and immigrant workers. Um, and she's wondering how this can filter into rural communities around the world. I'm from <laughs> Michigan. So I'm like, yes, that is why it feels like it's from the Midwest, because I, too, am from the Midwest. <laughs> and so that is why I'm like, yes, that is exactly what it feels like that. Um, I, interestingly, which is, I would say, has been a, a surprise. Not like I'm not super surprised, but a definitely surprised. I've given as many talks in predominantly white rural colleges as I've given any place else, in part because, oh, so that's going on this guy. Oh, man. I'm so, yeah, I already told John how, like, you know, I have um, aspirations to move abroad at some point. So I'm very uh, jealous of those of you who are from the States, but now living <laughs> uh, in, 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 in Europe, particularly in the UK. Um, among the challenges I think that I try to talk about in my broader talk in rural communities, um, it really, I address, I address it more in that section on the food pyramid scheme. Um, and really thinking about how these rural communities can um, reclaim a sense of food sovereignty of their own land. So how can churches in those spaces actually grow food, employ people from the community, from those spaces to grow their food, to opt out of and bypass, you know, grocery stores that are exploiting them and not paying them a living wage? Like essentially, how can the church become a hub? How can we use church land as farmland? I think that's one really important way for folks to be able to, to um, take this seriously. I think a lot of in a lot of those rural communities in the states, especially, people are Christian. And I don't think they necessarily have the language to articulate how this is an economic issue that impacts them as well. And so I try to provide that kind of theological language that I've been told is useful for, for them to understand, oh, I can see it now how this actually is inconsistent with um, our understanding of what it means to not only to be human, but relationship with the land. This is why it's so crazy when I was writing the book, I got a lot of pushback for, I write a lot about the Bible. You know, and people are like, oh, you remember the Bible, you know, you're not a biblical scholar, people don't care. The people that I actually write to really do care. And so that was something that was really helpful too in those conversations as people wanted to be able to go to their school boards, to their community boards, like they use religion in these conversations and they wanted to be able to do, so they needed a language to articulate their 
like hurts and the way they were struggling that would be persuasive to those who were in power. And so some of that is kind of crafting a language as well. Um, and so I, I, around the world, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. <laughs> like I have some ideas, but the first idea I would have, honestly, would be to actually meet with those people in the rural communities and figure out a way to come be in conversation with them to empower their voice in the development of a plan. But I suspect it wouldn't be just amplifying their voices, but it would be asking them what they actually think can work. And the reason I talk about using church land as farmland is because that's what I did. I went to, I spent a bunch of time in, my family's from Mississippi and Louisiana. So I was there in the Carolinas and I just talked to people in rural communities. And they're like, hey man, if we use this, then we, we get opt out of that. And I was like, great, let me, let me work on that. Um, a lot of folks actually know what they need to do. They just don't have someone willing, someone fighting for them or giving them the resources they need to be able to do it. And so that's what I try to do in my privileged position now, because I, I fully, I'm fully aware that I'm deeply, deeply privileged uh, to be doing this work. Thank you, Chris. I mean, that's just excellent as well to kind of reflect on, um, you know, uh, we know communities know what to do. They just need resources and support and there needs to be political will as well, I suppose. Um, any, I, I think we have time to take one final question. If anyone has a question, a burning question left, um, or if not, if you have a follow-up question, Chris, perhaps you'd be happy for folk to email you or raise any concerns or questions that they have perhaps later. Yeah, I totally feel free to email me. Um, I saw John just waved his hand. Um, that's one way. That's totally fine. Um, you know, I would have actually, I'm going to upload um, a flyer for my book. So if you are interested in buying it, you can get a discount code because that's where I really kind of articulate a lot of the, well, half of the stuff I said today is from the book and I kind of build it out more. Um, the other articles I've written are available for free on my website because I'm all for like free I had to write this stuff to get tenure, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't even, I would just write stuff and just put on the internet and give it for free anyway, but that's just not, they won't give me tenure if I do that. So, so um, all that stuff is for free. Um, so I'll put my website link in the chat as well. Um, if you're curious about my thinking about some of this uh, and some of the work that I've done. Um, but yeah, feel free to email me. I would love to be in conversation about this. This work is so, so important. I am planning on being at the next Oxford Food Conference in January. So I'll be around um in the uk next year so we'll see what happens i was supposed to teach a class there in london but covid keeps changing that so i don't know man we'll see that's excellent um the reason why you're seeing lots of nervous laughter is that all the academics in the room are laughing when you talk about what we have to do for 10 oh yes <laughs> see, i know so i don't know how many academics are here but i'm like i just like to write stuff for public consumption but that doesn't necessarily work so i appreciate the chuckles i appreciate the chuckles <laughs> Um, I'm just going to say thank you so much, Chris. That was just absolutely brilliant and just a fantastic way to end um, two really um, incredible and thought-provoking days. I think you've given us so much to think about and also so much to do, which is, um, you know, so much to mobilize us in, in what we have to do. So thank you so, so much. I'll hand back to John because he was waving his hand. So back to you, John. <laughs> um. Yeah, well, I guess that we kind of reached our time, but I do have one quick question. Um, I guess part of, and this maybe is tied to my own journey, but a lot of what you're talking about is um, having land be invisible, even to like, it was like I was blind to land. Like I'd see obviously a beautiful space and get it, but being completely blind to um, uh, seasons other than how it affected me, like with cold or rain not understanding seasonality in terms of growing, the plants, all of that. And having kind of a ecological conversion has awakened me to land. I guess my question to you is, can you, do you believe you can truly see yourself without seeing yourself within the context of creation? No, I don't believe you can. I mean, I think, I think and, and, and that, is, that reminded me to share the book I was thinking about earlier uh, by Willie Jennings, um, The Christian Imagination. I think it's in this, the book is super long. The second chapter, he talks about the land. And um, I would say for me, this wasn't recent because I grew up with grandparents who were deeply connected to the land and their grandpa who talks about the land who wanted us to buy a house because he knew about the importance of and how hard it was for black people to have the land or have land. Um, but the ways in which the land is connected to our identity and how, and this is why I talk about coloniality and how we're all kind of wrapped up in it, how 
we went from being having a human organizational structure of you know people who were british or people who were french or people who were spanish or whatever to having this broad categorization of whiteness and blackness and asianness and that delinking from the land really has had devastating impacts to how we think about ecology because we really don't see ourselves as connected to the land as such as a per, as individuals as a species and that i think is just is a huge um gaping flaw <laughs> you know within within our understanding of what it means to be human and that's why I, I try to address it in my own unique ways but you're right like i think the challenge i have john and I'll, I'll say this to wrap up is you know there's so much trauma that different groups have with the land right and so um you know for black people going working the land can i bring up traumas of enslavement and that's one particular kind of trauma that you have to deal with. Like I write about that in one of the chapters I uploaded to here, Blood in the Soil. Um, some of us have been alienated because we think it's it's like what poor people do or we want it to be more developed. And so we're dealing with the kind of narratives around the land. And so how do we de-link from those narratives to have a way to connect to the land that is not only positive, but also life affirming of who we are as individuals and who we are as a community and a collective. Um, so yeah, no, this is, um, that's such a great, great question. And, and I'm still workshopping a good answer. We um, started this conference with my kind of declaration of let's become people and land as a prophetic action. So I feel like it's come full circle with what you're talking about. Um, I love that you've got, you're obviously deeply thoughtful theolo theologian, but you're also a pastor. So I wonder if you'd kind of end this conference by praying for us and wrapping it up and saying a word of prayer for all of us. Yeah, no, thank you for asking me. I think that's, um, you know, something that um, I call myself a practical theologian because everything I write, again, I try to write for the community. So thank you for the invitation. And then I invite us to be an attitude of prayer. Most gracious God, God of hope, of compassion, of wonder, we are so honored, so blessed, so fortunate to have been able to gather, not only to have this conversation, but the conversations that have taken place earlier, to be able to create community, to be able to meet folks from all over the world, to discern, Lord, how you've called us to be in relationship, not only with each other, Lord, not only with your creation, but how might we deepen our relationship with you? We ask that you would allow your spirit to work within us, to inspire us, Lord, so that we go into the world able to apply what we have learned today, Lord, inspired to continue to create and to imagine how we might live into and build this beloved community so that we, Lord, can be the fulfillment of your prayer to create earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this strength. Give us the will. Give us the abilities to do this work so that we, Lord, can be the disciples you've called us to be and to create the change that you've called us to create, to pull people towards love so that we, Lord, can be embodiments of love in the world. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christopher. And thanks everyone for coming. It's been really special. Go and be blessed and rewatch everything on YouTube. <laughs> That's all I get. Get some books. It'll be good. Bye, everyone. <laughs>